Today, I think it's, a, uh, it's more just to um, show you some recent work um, we have been doing and how to apply this very, I think, very simple uh, idea of Markham random fields um, to study on um, this analyzed genomics data. I'll show you on um, the computational side is on this work, but it's pretty straightforward, but more of the general idea and also the, the usefulness of uh, this framework. And uh, this is uh, mostly the work done um, by um, my former postdoc, uh, Min Chen, and right now current uh, scientist, Lin Ho, in my group, also is a very competent uh, third year student in my lab. And these are our medical collaborators on the project, on these different projects. Uh, so here's an uh, outline of my talk today. Uh, first, it's a very single slide to show you what marker random field is. It's a very uh, straightforward to tell you what it is. And then we'll actually discuss uh, three uh, separate applications. Uh, two have to do with uh, the so-called uh, genome-wide association studies. So I'll give you a very, very uh, brief uh, introduction about what this uh, field is. And uh, in this context, there are two different ways you can incorporate uh, information from other, uh, other um, uh, domains. I'll talk about known pathways and co-expression networks. And uh, on the third uh, application area is to really um, how to apply this general thinking or framework to analyze the gene expression data uh, in the human brains. And uh, 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 conclude with a few remarks. Just feel free to stop me anytime you have any questions. I'm not sure the background is the audience. Some may be uh, very familiar with the statistical framework or the, the tools, or some may be very familiar with the bi biological background, maybe a mixture of both. Um, so this is a, for laziness, this is a definition from Wikipedia. <laughs> okay. uh, it's a basically, uh, uh, I didn't get enough time just to really um, put on different textbooks. So it's a set of random variables uh, having Markov property described by an undivided graph. Uh, so there's a st uh, three keywords. Uh, so we try to uh, really, uh, this Markov random field is a way to model the joint distribution of a set of random variables. Okay. And then there's underlying um, graph, undivided graph. Okay, uh, relating these different variables. In general, we talk about like, independent random variables or dependent random variables. Um, we can talk about Markov, Markov chains, but the Markov chain is like linear or sequential order, but this Markov random field is really defined um, by a graph. And the Markov property essentially means that um, um, for any random variable, there's a neighbors, right? In the Markov chain context, there's a thing before or after. And uh, if it has sequential, sequential order, then there's uh, like time one, two, three. In the Markov chain uh, context, a condition on current event, everything else before that is irrelevant for future events. The same thing for like Markham random field is the same if you have run, if you have graph, graph defines neighbor, neighbor through edges. So this, I'll show you a few examples. It essentially says that um, given its neighbors, the, the value or the state of a random variable condition on the neighbors is independent of anything else, right, the Markov property. It's very, very just first order dependence. Um, property is very straightforward. And uh, actually, uh, Markham random field has been applied in um, uh, other contexts other than the th three things I'm going to talk about. Uh, this is a few examples on uh, some uh, other, uh, other, other application areas. So the first uh, major topic I'm going to discuss about application or usefulness of Markham random field concept is uh, about uh, geno genome-wide association studies. And the first one talk about on uh, this uh, given some known pathway information. Um, so it's a very very brief um, overview of what genome wide association studies are. So this is uh, the karyotype of our um, genomes. Right, there's 23 pairs of chromosomes, and there's a 22 pairs of autosomes. So there's a sex chromosome. This is X. This is Y. This is for male. For female, there's two copies of X. Right. On the way up, I saw the poster talking about two axes. <laughs> it's another talk about these two copies of this. But my talk is saying this, the, 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 this is sort of how the general, we have 23 pairs of chromosomes. Uh, in total, there are 3 billion base pairs. So it's a, a lot of, lot of uh, pairs. And for the most part, 99.9%, um, people in this room are identical. We have identical um, copies, of these so-called the nucleotides, sequences. But from time to time, uh, things are different, right? The one you inherit from your mother may be the one uh, may be different from the one you inherit from your father, right? Uh, so this one, maybe this one person has two copies of chromosomes, like two chromosomes, one from the father, one from the mother, and the mother has a CG pair, the, the father has a TA pair. So it's called uh, SNP. Uh, it's an acronym for single nucleotide polymorphism. So I'll, go, I'll keep mentioning SNP. Um, in my talk, it's nothing more than a marker or random, you can think about variable. 
um, people may have different values for this random variable. It's a discrete value, like C or T. So SNPs, or single nucleotide polymorphisms, are alterations in DNA involving a single base pair. And in total, people uh, today know about there are more than 10 million such single nucleotide polymorphisms in the human population. It's a large number. Uh, if you uh, get down to those uh, variants occurring only once or twice in the whole population, the number is even larger. So every single base may have a chance to be mutated. So the, the 3 billion may be the ultimate number that you're going to get to. And the majority have no phenotype effects. The genome-wide association uh, studies uh, are essentially they're trying to identify those SNPs, those variables, or those sites um, that are relevant to the particular phenotypes of your interest. Right, so interest in cancer or obesity or anything else, um, you can um, take on this very, very general uh, approach to do this. Uh, how to do this? Uh, so right now, the technology has evolved uh, very, very rapidly in the last about uh, eight years. About eight years ago, the first uh, this genome-wide association study paper was published by a colleague at Yale. Uh, she's able to look at 100,000 markers in the human genome. Still, at that time, it was a pretty, pretty large number, 100,000. But right now, actually, we are getting these markers on the 2.5 or 5 million markers for about like 100 um, or $150. So it's very, very cheap to generate uh, a large number of, uh, of uh, marker information from everything. So if you take all these um, people in this room, get DNA, uh, we can generate within a day, say, within a week, about like, we can get uh, these um, predefined positions, 5 million positions in the genome. We can tell you what they are. So this is for just for one marker. For example, um, we want to identify um, whether, um, oh, say, this is your favorite marker, say, blood type or something, ABO, has anything to do with your future, right? When do you die or how much you earn, whatever. Uh, so we have these people who earn a lot of salaries and a bunch of homeless people here or vice versa. And you get your blood. And you say this is a marker, like blood type or whatever. And then you look at this individual, you get, uh, each individual get genotype, right? The genotype uh, is denoted by like two letter thing because you have maternal chromosome and paternal chromosome, right? So for this one, you have CT, et cetera, CT, TT, CT. And for those, the, you have a case group, uh, you have a control group, you have two different groups, right? And you want to uh, look at whether um, whatever um, the, the, the genotype you have, uh, at this marker, has anything to do with this, the phenotypes, the phenotype of interest, right? You just tally up, right? So essentially, for the controls, there's only like three possible genotypes. There's a, a C, C, T, T, C, T, right? Because there's each marker, there's only two possibilities. So there's one, two, three, or zero, one, two, depending how you, how you, how you code it. For the cases, you have the same thing, right? So you can condense all this data into a very simple two by three table, right? So uh, the, each row corresponds to the control group and the case group, right? There's two rows corresponding to group, and three columns correspond to the number of people with a particular genotype, like A, like CC, TT, CT. So you, you get down to like very simple two by three contingency table here. And you can just do very simple chi-square tests, whatever tests of your, uh, your, your, your favorite. And in this particular case, okay, you get this so-called odds ratio to look at the 1.35, you get p-value. Okay, it's so a very, very small p-value. This may suggest this marker may have something to do with the phenotype, right? So it's a very straightforward approach. You get people with the phenotype, without the phenotype, and you look at every single marker one by one. That's a very standard approach. And you do it five million times. Okay. And, and then you tally up all the results uh, from those showing the, the strongest evidence association based on, say, p-value and other things and uh, you run them from number one, two, three, up to, uh, down to five million, right? So this is typical output uh, for genome-wide association uh, study. And this is so-called, um, uh, people call Manhattan plot, some people call it a Dubai plot, depending on how many peaks you have here. Um, so you have this standard setup I mentioned. There's the cases, you have controls, and these are the, say, you, you just order on the markers from chromosome one, two, three, et cetera. And on the y-axis is a minus log 10 uh, p-value, right? The larger uh, this value is, the more evidence, uh, studio evidence you have suggesting association between this marker and the phenotype. In this particular case, MHC is a, uh, had to do with the, the immune response, the, in, in, uh, the, the immunological process, major histocompatibility and locus in the human genome, right? So this 
shows up in almost every single immune-related disease um, people have looked at, and this is another one. So this is a typical output uh, from genome-wide association studies. Okay, any questions? So, so far people have been quite successful um, with this approach. They identify thousands of uh, these markers, and a lot of these markers uh, have been turned into a clinical test to say if you have this marker, you have increased risk, and what does it imply to? But this is not going to focus on today's talk. But there are um, many, many challenges. Uh, so the, the framework is very straightforward. You get people with disease, without disease, you genotype a bunch of markers, you do every single test. Uh, for some diseases, unlike the one um, we have been um, working with, um, like a Crohn's disease, there are about uh, 200 things have been found to be associated with the phenotype. So that's been great success. Uh, other diseases are a lot more challenging, like schizophrenia. The most recent paper just appeared in Nature Genetics that found that about 20 based on like 15,000 subjects. Uh, other phenotypes uh, also I'm involved in like substance abuse, like uh, the, uh, uh, the nicotine dependence, right? Or uh, other, um, uh, the other, other substance abuses are a lot, lot more challenging to identify. Uh, the other disease um, I'm going to talk about later on, the, Crohn, uh, the, the, the autism, it's another challenging disease where this general approach doesn't really work out well. Okay. Questions? Yeah. So is the reason that that is true is that the phenotype isn't very clear in those other diseases? That's, 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 yeah, that's a great point. Yeah. So it's not clear, like schizophrenia, um, bipolar, there's a lot of, yeah. Yeah. And another thing, the epilepsy, there's tens of uh, subtype epilepsy. People have very, very uh, challenging time to identify markers associated. The phenotype is a key here, yeah. Um, Another thing is, uh, even, even for the, uh, the case of a Crohn's disease, uh, people have found 200 genes associated with the Crohn's disease. For height, people have already found about 300 markers, 400 markers associated with the height. Okay? But given those already found, there are, many, there are many, many others that remain to be found. And people, there are different approaches to estimate how many things that haven't been found. Right? For Crohn's disease, people estimate maybe, maybe about 1,000 still out there. For height, maybe thousands or even more. So there, so 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 far have been successful for those markers with like pretty good, or you can say this not strong or moderate effects. But most markers they have very weak effects. So in order to identify those markers, uh, if you just do this very standard approach, doing this one marker by marker, you may be able to do it. You may need to recruit maybe one million people or two million people. Which people actually really use, like for blood pressure, people get to 100,000 people put together to identify these markers associated with blood pressure. But still, um, this simple approach um, may not work out well for all those uh, things associated with the phenotype above certain threshold. And the major, uh, another thing is, uh, let me say there's also multiple comparison issue. That's that, uh, so this one, you may say, okay, this is a very, very uh, uh, significant result, right? 10 to the minus seven, think of p-value. Usually. In most studies, um, 0.01 is a cutoff. Anything below 0.01 or 0.01, we feel pretty comfor comfortable, like saying we can so-called reject the null hypothesis, where there's no association between the marker and phenotype. So in this case, it's just very simple math. And so if we have, we use like 2.5 million chips now for uh, ongoing schizophrenia study, if you set the p-value of 0.0001 as cutoff, just by chance, you expect to see 2,500 positive signals, right? Just by chance if the belief with this p-value derived is, is valid. So usually people use like five times 10 to the minus eight. If you multiply by this by one million markers, that gives you the overall control 0.05. That's what people use, right? So if you couple these weak effects that are difficult to detect, also people are concerned about this uh, multiple comparison issue that gave you, you, you need to really set very, very, very stringent threshold, then it's pretty much hopeless, right, for those markers to get to this level of this level of evidence of, of social association. Right? So the idea is now, uh, if we go a little bit beyond uh, what uh, we have been talking about, doing single marker by marker, uh, the only way to move forward is maybe we can take advantage of other information people know about. So that's really the, this marker random field idea comes in. And the major goal of the GWAS study uh, is really to say if you have one or 2.5 million markers, um, the goal is for any given study, the goal is not to make a definite, uh, it's, it's what to, to, to a certain degree, we've, we've made a definite statement about these markers are associated with disease. But more important question is, now we have 2.5 million markers, can we reduce this set to maybe 50 or 100 markers where people can do follow-up studies, 
to validate. So the ranking is very important. We want to have the best ranking of these markers as possible so that people have a better chance for success when they try to replicate in a follow-up study. Okay. So I say the major goal, at least for my talk today, is to prioritize SNPs for follow-up studies. Okay. Now just say to make a definite statement about this marker is associated or not associated with the disease phenotype. So there are different ways to improve the power. Um, first, uh, it's very um, intuitive. Although we have 2.5 million SNPs or 10 million SNPs, these SNPs, they are not equal. They are not equal right? Some SNPs, they are in coding regions. They, they change the amino acid. So it's called the non-synonymous SNPs. And this high, probably high likelihood, high likelihood to be functionally relevant than a SNP falling into this called a junk region. Right? People know they are no longer junk regions, but still just pr prior, yeah, this INCO, yeah, the project, all these things. But still, um, you can use some kind of bioinformatics based uh, these uh, predictions about the relevance of these different SNPs. Yeah, like the genes, intergenic regions, and, uh, and other, whether the conservation across different species. There's a lot of work has been done in this area. And the other one, you can look at some experimental based data like ENCODE, MOD ENCODE, where um, these trying to really look at the whole human genome to say, okay, these parts may be more relevant, functional relevant than the other parts, right? So for SNPs falling into those parts that as evidence of functional relevance, um, when you analyze the, the so for, for, for example, for two SNPs, they have equal p-value, like 10 to minus five. One is in this region of functional relevance, you believe the other is for junk region you will probably give higher prior or get higher weight to the, the SNP falling into sort of functionally relevant regions. So it's a very straightforward idea. Uh, multiple approaches have been proposed. And also gene annotations. And I'm going to um, talk about a couple of things um, today. One is to how to utilize the pathway information here and to help us to better prioritize the signals. And the other one, how to take advantage of the high throughput uh, data from genomics and proteomics uh, the technologies. So this is the first, the pathway information there. Um, there are uh, many, many um, public domain databases where you can uh, have access to like a BioCutter or uh, the CAC uh, based in, in Japan where um, people have curated uh, the, the literature, also the uh, other, uh, other uh, avi, uh, papers and other evidence of how to put data. They create this called the pathway diagram. This pathway diagram, uh, there's like different uh, enzyme or proteins involved on this. Uh, so you think a pathway is really a construct. It's, it's no, there's nothing called pathway in a cell, right? It's only like interactions among different molecules. But it's just a way to simplify our understanding or simplify people's knowledge about how things work in cells. So this, this is really the, uh, this, the metabolic, this is more the signaling, path, uh, signaling pathway where you know how these different molecules interact, right? So the question is um, whether there's any way this such pathway information whether such pathway information provides any uh, knowledge or gives any benefit when you try to combine the pathway information with the GWAS data, the data you have for single markers, whether there's a way you can combine both that can give you a better way to organize the results, right? Instead of just using the p-values to rank the SNPs, by incorporating pathway information here, uh, hopefully you can get a better ranking of the markers. So that, that's a goal, okay? And to see there's any value of such um, sort of uh, the, the um, pathway uh, information here on the, this um, uh, sort of uh, experiment. So this is based on um, a data set I'm going to talk about later on, on a Crohn's disease. Uh, the Crohn's disease, this is a relatively small sample size, about 600 uh, cases, 600 controls. So for a given pathway, um, for example, for every single pathway, there are multiple genes here, right? For each gene, we can derive a score based on multiple SNPs within a gene. It's based on the annotation of the genes. So I'm going, not going to talk about how we derive that. But say, you can think of every single SNP, every single gene here has a summary statistics defining the evidence association of this gene with the phenotype, right? So you have multiple, for every single gene, there's a, there's a p-value. You have a bunch of p-values overlaid on this pathway, okay? And the question is, what was your intuition here? What trying to uh, get benefit? So if you think the, the intuition is that if this gene is involved, right? If this gene is involved, uh, for example, here uh, in the disease phenotype, if you want to choose another gene in this pathway that are, is likely to be involved, your bet may be more around C4 or something else, right? Because this gene already involved, 
on this, maybe they form sort of some, some kind of complex, whatever. And so the likelihood this one probably is higher than the others, right? So in terms of p-value or evidence of association uh, with uh, the phenotype, what you are trying to we are trying to observe, trying to, to hope we want to observe is that if you have a small p-value for a given gene, hopefully the genes on average nearby also will tend to show smaller p-values. Even though they are not like 0.001, but overall still may, uh, may seem to hopefully that uh, be overall like lower p-value than the other genes or sort of random genes or other genes uh, in the other parts of pathway, right? So, so, so if you can see that, then that gives us some confidence to move forward, saying this pathway information, also we call the topology information, does offer some insight or some information about how these genes are associated with the phenotype. Okay, so this is the rationale. So we, we did that. Um, so this for Crohn's disease, um, we look at many, many pathways. Uh, so for each gene in the pathway, uh, we just gave a cutoff, 0.15. And if you assign cut out too stringent, there will be very, very few things like below 0.15. So we want to achieve balance between signal and noise, right? So this 0.15 be varied and seem to be um, providing some good balance. So we label each gene with either plus one or minus, minus one at a specific significant cut of 0.15. So given the, the say the GWA, the genome-wide data, genome association data, now every single uh, gene here uh, has a label now, 0.1 or plus one or minus one depending on the p-value at this particular cutoff. So um, based on the same rationale what I discussed earlier, so we want to see clustering of plus ones together, right? And maybe not so much for minus one, but we want to see the, cl the plus, plus ones seem to be gravitated towards each other, right? Then that suggests maybe some evidence showing that there are some kind of neighboring um, effects. And uh, so for a given pathway, there are many, many edges. We just count the number of edges where um, both nodes are labeled plus one. Okay. So for example, in this one, there's many, many edges here. And we just look at every single edge to see the pairs. I look at this one, how many pairs actually um, uh, they have both one. We call it DK. Okay. So how to look at whether, there's a in whether this DK is large enough to be interesting or not. So we just very simple, simple procedure. Suppose the label plus one or minus one has nothing to do with sort of the, the neighbors, the topology. We just permute them right, in, the, in, the, in, this, in this pathway, and we recount them. Right? So we can look at this DK as a what sort of to characterize or define, quantify the neighboring uh, genes, both showing evidence association at this relative loose cut of 0.15. And when we permute them, and we say, if there's nothing there, uh, we can say what uh, that number should be. We compare this DK to this permuted uh, DK. We permute multiple times. And if this DK, say, if suppose this DK is, uh, say, uh, for example, five. On the other hand, uh, for the permuted set, if you permute 100 times, only 10 out of 100 times, the DK is five or above. We gave this one a sort of, use this 10 divided by 100, point 0.1, right? So if the, there's no clustering, there's no topological relevance, we expect this one to be uh, so somewhat uniform between zero and one, right? If you look at this permitted p-value. But um, we, look, we run this across multiple pathways, but we do observe this tendency of skewness toward the left, suggesting that on average, what you actually do for the real data, you will observe a tendency that the associated genes, they tend to cluster together um, based on this topological information you have on pathway, right? So that's the, the first thing we did. I said, okay, let's, um, maybe it's some, something uh, worthwhile just to uh, uh, exploit this uh, uh, feature to see whether we can get um, uh, better ranking of the, the, the genes um, using this pathway information. Okay, yeah. So was your basis for choosing a particular gene or pathway some expected relationship to the Crohn's disease or was it just because you had one SNP type relevance in that pathway, so therefore the things that No, this is a this is up about like uh, six hundred pathways. There's no So you don't No, they're just yeah, just no, yeah. Yeah. I'm not a biologist, but I'm just curious. How uh, uh, complete is this pathway information? Very unlimited very limited. 
very, very limited. So I'm going to talk, that's the, the second topic, yeah. Um, for the uh, CAC pathways, there may be like 4,000 genes out of 23,000. So it's a, it's a very, very um, partial and biased <laughs> selection, yeah. Okay. So uh, this gives our, our uh, about four or five years ago, we start to um, um, actually uh, have this idea. And it took us a while to implement, but this is a very simple uh, like uh, uh, the setup. So we start from like interactional pathway. I'm gonna talk about co-expression now or later on. Say, if you assume it's to be known, the the chi pathway to be known, and uh, we what we observe um, also each gene suppose there's a hidden or unobserved latent label for that gene, either associated or not associated. We call it a plus one associated, minus one not associated. This is what we are interested in uh, making inference about, and what this is a given from the pathway database uh, of your, your favorite choice. And this is what we want to infer, and this will be observed from the genome-wide association data. Is for each gene in the pathway, we have some kind of measure or score to quantify for the data you have how much evidence there is for this gene to be associated with the phenotype. Right? So essentially what we're trying to do is, um, without using the network, we make, so we make inference about the purely based on Z, right? This is the evidence. And now we try to incorporate the network information here, so we have to make inference about the D, the disease label, conditional on the network structure, and the observed evidence association at per gene level. Right? So this is where we try to incorporate the network information. Um, so this is a um, where this uh, marker random field uh, comes in to help us. So we model the pathway as undirected graph. Although in, re in reality, like for signaling network or one, there's a direction. But we just say we, let's, we, we, we don't know how to deal with that. Let's say that's treated as undirected graph. Okay, just say this is here and treat as undirected. And uh, we model uh, the dependency by uh, marker random field. So for example, uh, for this gene here, uh, what this implies is that there's an underlying disease association label can be either minus one or plus one, meaning not associated with the disease or associated with disease. So this gene has one, two, three, four, four neighbors, okay? These four neighbors also have their disease asso association labels, plus one or minus one, right? So what Marco Random Field says that essentially is conditional on the labels of these four neighboring genes, the disease status associated with this gene is not, has nothing to do with the disease association labels of all the other genes in the pathway. This is only dependent on neighbors, but nothing else. Okay? So this is just a very simple way to conceptualize, to formulate the way we observe. In reality, you may argue that um, probably this may not be the best. There may be other ways to say the second order, but this sort of some to be a compromise between incorporating dependency and the computational uh, feasibility. Right, so this is a, a simpler way to say, now we have a, we model pathway as a graph. These are the different genes, and uh, their nodes we define plus one is associated with disease, minus one otherwise. And uh, this is really the, the random variable uh, defining this marker random field, S i, can be, um, which can be either plus one or minus one, and so this is say the spatial random factor, but it's really defined, actually defined by the by the, uh, the this graph, and we try to infer this as based on the network topology and also the observed evidence of association at per gene level. Okay, so how to formulate uh, this the, the the prior distribution on uh, this? How we say this is just very standard the nearest neighbor gives measure. Uh, it's just how it's very easy to see how we define. So this is really the prior distribution. Suppose you have n genes, in total you have two to the n power possible configurations, right? Plus one or minus one. So each possible configuration is associated, uh, there's, a, there's a sort of the density or the, the probability associated with that particular configuration. That's defined by these sort of uh, multiple, uh, these, these terms here. So this is more of the average how likely a particular gene is involved. It has nothing to do with the topology, right? So this one essentially to say that um, it, tau one defines the neighboring effects for positive association or true association here, right? We can talk about this WI and WJ more like 
So it's I, I, S, I, I, S, J. So if they're both plus one, plus one here, and it, this will encourage neighbors to be uh, both associated with the disease, right? So this one. And this one encourage the neighbors to be n not associated with the disease. It's a tau zero and tau one. It's an indicator functions and it's a prime parameters. So it's a very standard uh, setup. And if you look at this one, you say, now uh, this prior uh, does impose some kind of spatial uh, dependence or the, this uh, graph dependence uh, about the labels for different genes on the graph and only involves neighbors, okay? And uh, I'm going to skip the, um, the more of the, the, the derivation here. It's pretty uh, straightforward, I'm taking my, my time. Okay. Um, this is, a, I think after you have this sort of a setup, the following is pretty straightforward. Um, there, it takes some time mm, uh, for a post like a year's time just to figure out the, 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 uh, the mechanics, how this works. But it is, uh, it's pretty straightforward just to get it done. Um, I'll skip that. So first, let me just look at uh, how well uh, this really works in the uh, scenario where we, we know uh, the, the truth. Uh, so this one case, we have disease model. Um, there's, a, uh, there's a three genes involved, G1, G2, G3. And they, they, they form a sort of like a clique in a way, not quite, but uh, in, in a graph. They're uh, like pairwise associated, and the other they are not. And we assume that like, this is a multi genetic model. Uh, some of the disease risk is dependent on multiplicity effects of these three different genes. Um, we vary uh, how frequent uh, the, the mutation is in the population. Uh, how common or how rare the disease, 5%, 10%, 15% in the population of people, uh, people in the population having the disease. Also the effect size, right? How strong uh, each gene uh, has effect on the phenotype. Um, we assume there are 600 cases getting controls for each model. Um, we simulate, um, for pretty cheap, uh, cheap to simulate 500 data sets. We look overall on uh, how well on um, uh, this. So just focus on the first one. Uh, there's multiple things here. Um, so in case there's a, the disease is a 5% of in the population, and the effect size is pretty small, 1.05. And uh, if you look at a, a minor low frequency, 5%, uh, in general, uh, if you do a P run, and the P, if you rank all the genes by the P value, and uh, you can see the, if you want to pick up genes on the, based on AOC, it's hopeless, 0.5. Uh, it's like a random. If you're based on the posterior, you'll do a little bit better, like 0.55. Uh, you, you, you get something better uh, if you have a larger, higher prevalence or stronger effect. But in every single case, you see, this is the result purely just using the gene level evidence without incorporating the topology. And this is really incorporating topology. You do see this improvement to identify the genes that truly associate um, with the disease uh, compared to um, uh, the genes not associated with disease. This is a little bit more complex, and uh, you got similar results. Now. Um, we apply this uh, to a Crohn's disease data set. That's really the, the motivating uh, example uh, from our collaborator, Judy Cho at Yale, uh, who actually was, who was going to leave for Mount Sinai in, in a couple months, unfortunately. Um, so this is a, um, one of the most successful diseases that have been studied based on the genome association studies. And this is really the area involved is the, the gut disease. Uh, you got this, uh, it's a very common um, uh, among these, the Ashkenazi Jews, and uh, also more common, like uh, in the in the um, in the uh, Caucasian population than Asians. And this just show a timeline. Um, this is now the um, the most most uh, recent one. So the most recent one has a, about about um, 170 genes associated um, with Crohn's disease found. So the first one um, that was the, the there's a science paper. You can see the the uh, the timeline. Uh, starting from here, I'm picking up, and it's go still shooting up in terms of how many genes people have found to be associated with the Crohn's disease. Uh, for this particular exercise, um, we look at uh, the uh, 30 um, genes that was uh, found to be um, associated. They probably people know they are truly associated. And we see how well uh, different approaches can truly recover these genes. So uh, this cohort has about it's a small sample size, 401 cases and 433 controls. The most recent one has about 50,000 cases, 50,000 controls. That's where the difference between like three or four years. And um, we look at the pathways from CAC. Uh, this is Kyoto, uh, the base in Kyoto in Japan is BioCarter and GenMap. So what's shown here is really a comparison of uh, looking at the AUC, the area under the curve. It's just more summary how well we can capture the genes 
that um, we, we know for, for sure they are associated with the Crohn's disease. And the larger um, this AOC number is, um, the better the approach uh, is. So the x-axis corresponds to how well, um, so each, each plot represents a particular pathway because we want to use pathway information. And, uh, and this, each particular one, so this says the AOC based on the posterior, like trying to uh, the approach using the, uh, the, the pathway topology information, and the other one not. So in general, you'll see this overall shift towards like the, to the right and saying uh, in, on average, actually we do a um, better job by incorporating uh, the prior information uh, into this. Any questions? So that's how we get start off on this, uh, this particular uh, marker random field. So we, we felt pretty good um, so this may work. And yes? Uh, I guess one thing that sure. I was thinking about while you had yeah. to do that. In your simple model network where you had the three genes, right. you had what looked like a bypass connection between the top one and the bottom. Right. Does that imply just statistical association or does it imply some alternative pathway? Oh, this one? Mm -hmm. um, No, actually, um, this is very, I mean, um, people in network uh, have identified this kind of called a fit forward loop, very common. Right, are three proteins, A, B, C. A can go, actually A can activate C through B or can activate C directly. There are two, yeah. So this, actually this is probably the most commonly observed so-called uh, network motif, we call the fit forward loop. Okay, so, well, we talked about the Right, yeah. I'm Right. Yeah, actually, um, someone like in Israel, the Uri Allen, and uh, that's how he started his career by capturing these so-called motifs about 10 years ago. And he has a whole book talking about these different things. So it's statistical relationships, but it must have some... It's a molecular, it's, it's like a regulatory relationship, right? So they, they have a, like different biological systems where you cut these different proteins, how they interact with each other, yeah. Um, so as I said, I told this approach, and um, this is a pretty nice, but uh, there is uh, a I think, question I raised earlier. Uh, a lot of these known pathways, they only contain a, a small fraction of all the genes uh, in the genome. So there's limited information there. So when we, you apply this, and uh, uh, you may not be able to get uh, to cover um, actually most genes uh, in the human genome. And another thing is that uh, the, the network is treated as a static. It's a, it's a steady network, whereas um, that may not be the case. Um, the network in your brain may be different from the network in your lung, may be different from the network in your gut, different. So uh, this is a very, very steady picture, may, may not be the best way. So we made some small uh, sort of uh, um, improvement about this, the first approach. So we use uh, this so-called uh, co-expression network. So what co-expression networks are? So this really based on this technology. So it's very mature now, the micro -ray technology. It started about um, 95, right around when I uh, was a uh, graduate from my graduate school, and uh, started people with the, the, the nylon array, the glass array. Now it's everything is sort of a, um, a in the industrial standardized um, arrays. You can get like thirty, forty dollars to do um, very high density, like the whole genome arrays. So essentially, what these measures, these, these arrays measure actually the, the the expression level of every single gene uh, in the in the genome of given species for humans, for uh, for, for mice, for for, for rats, whatever organism. There's a uh, there's a microarray out there that people can use, and uh, you have different if you have different budgets, they can give you different options. Um, so the data has been accumulated in the public domain. Uh, there's a called the gene uh, expression omnibus. Also, there's another database uh, in Europe that um, this is not up to date, um, but this has many, many data points here. There's about 3,000 data sets. Um, there, there's a lot, lot more out there. So what these data sets offer you, it gives you overall the, the, the snapshot of the expression levels of all the genes in the sample you're studying. And uh, by looking across different samples, actually gives a way to, this is a way to visualize standard, uh, to visualize the, the patterns, right? So each one, uh, there's a, like, these are different, uh, in, in, say, different individuals here and the different genes. And you can really see that this kind of cluster you gives you there. You can cluster or group the samples 
uh, in the data you have, um, people have found this extremely useful starting from 96, maybe tens of thousands of papers have been published uh, on this using this approach. So what's a co-expression network? So a co-expression network, uh, remember for a known pathway, it defines a pairwise relationship between two genes, right? Uh, suppose you are interested in genes A and B. You want to see whether there's any association, really relationship between these two genes. You can monitor the expression levels of these two genes across many, many different samples, like 100 samples, 1,000 samples. If you see gene goes up, B always goes up. If gene A goes down, B always comes down. That suggests there are some kind of good correlation there. This suggests there may be some kind of co-expression regulation um, there. Or if one goes up, the other one always goes down. Also, there's also implies a sort of negative correlation. So you can build this depending on how you measure it. You can say you can connect all those gene pairs where if you look at enough samples, to sh they, these pairs I always show some kind of um, um, association. So there's a paper published by, by Wing Wang um, about uh, 11 years ago to uh, introduce this co-expression network idea to annotate, annotate genes. But essentially you can see there's different, this also is a graph describing the co-expression patterns of different genes because this is unbiased. This is unbiased in the sense that every single gene on the microarray that you use can be put on this graph. Right? So there's no selection, there's no knowledge. So given the data you have, as long as you have that gene, you can put the gene in, into this co-expression network. And you can think of this number here, one or two, to define the strength of the association, right? depending on, say, the correlation, whatever correlation you use. And this sort of a, there are different annotations, different colors for the uh, for for their the paper is their paper tries to use even to annotate the function of different genes. But it's just so the idea of it's a co-expression network. Okay. Um, so the co-expression network has been applied, and say you can apply the same idea, saying um, if this gene is associated um, with a disease, the neighboring genes may also be associated, more likely to be associated with the gene than a random gene, so we call defined random. So there's, in this case, there's no difference between a known or curated pathway and this co-expression network, right? That's the same thing, right? You can just apply the same type of methodology, defining this marker and random field based on this co-expression network. People have done that, and uh, people have, some, uh, have found success, uh, been successful. But what we found, actually, uh, this work by Lin Ho, uh, a, a scientist in the group, is that actually it turns out to be actually more useful not only just focus on one network, but by contrasting two networks. The network from diseased people and the network from the, the, the normal people, right? So the assumptions are that diseased genes undergo extensive rewiring. If you look, compare the, 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 the normal people to the diseased people, right? So there are a lot of things changed between the normal and the diseased people. They are not just changing in a way like a per gene level, but actually through the co-regulation of the different genes. And uh, so most interactions, actually, you look at the data, not change, regardless of the cell state. But those things that haven't, even though they are, say, the two, like gene A and B, they are highly correlated, right? If they are highly correlated both in the diseased people and in normal people, probably it's not as interesting as two genes, A and B, the correlation only changes, uh, changes right? It's the correlation only in the diseased people, but not in the normal people, or vice versa. Okay? So, the, the, so we, we uh, call this approach, we call this guilt by rewiring. We contrast two different networks. Okay? So this is the basic idea. So you have these four different genes, and uh, we can look at, we can get 100 people, 200 people, and we can define the pairwise relationship between each pair of genes, right? So you can say there's a three pairwise co-expression. It's, it's a co-expression network defined uh, in the control group, and it's a co-expression network defined in the disease group, right? If you compare the two networks, uh, these two blue edges, they are both present, right? Whereas this one is only present in the control group, but not in disease, and these two are actually new connections that appear in the diseased people, but not found in the control group, right? So the rewiring network between these two is defined by three edges, right? So the working assumption is that this network, if you want to make an inference or try to utilize the co-expression network information, this 
network probably is more relevant, more informative about the disease association status than either one alone. So if the difference may be more informative than either the, the study, or not either the, the control one or the disease one. And so we explore that and to see whether that actually that's the case. Uh, so we, we thought this idea and try to see whether there's any evidence suggesting that this rewiring idea concept may actually work. Uh, again, we went on to the Crohn's disease because it's a disease that people know a lot about and a lot of things have been found uh, to be associated uh, with the Crohn's. So that's sort of, when you have a lot of signals, it's, all e it's much easier, um, better to deal with. And so we uh, look at two different data sets. Uh, there's an NIDDD cohort um, collected by um, Judy Cho, about, um, about 1,000 subjects in total. And this is a welcome trust case control cohort, um, welcome trust case control cohort. About, they have about 3,000 controls, about 2,000 cases. So it's a much larger uh, data set. And they use different um, genotyping platforms. And uh, the reason we use these two different um, cohorts is that, uh, as I mentioned, like, so in this exercise, we want to see whether by incorporating this rewiring information, we can get um, better prioritization, better replication rate. So we use this data set more as a discovery cohort to rank all the genes and to see how well these ranked genes are replicated in the, this WTCCC cohort. So this is a discovery cohort. This is more for the validation cohort. And for micro data sets, um, so this is more the standard bioinformatics approach. Um, we don't have any local people who have microarrays. So we went to the, the gene expression omnibus and pulled out one data set. Uh, this is pu published in Inflammatory Bowel Disease Journal. Uh, this Agilent whole genome microarrays. There's tons of platforms there, about 18, about 19,000 genes. Uh, that starts the data set involved uh, 99 cases and 72 controls, right? So what we did, we construct a co-expression network um, based on the expression profiles of 99 disease patients. So there's a one network defined by disease people and also one network defined by the control people. Then we contrast the two and define the network. Um, so this is more the technical. We uh, try different approaches. We found this Pearson correlation, um, even though simple, but seem to be actually um, working out pretty well. And we use that as a way to define, to measure the co-expression patterns. And uh, we, c we can contrast or compare the, co the Pearson correlation between um, the, the uh, there are two coefficients we compare um, that calculate from the disease people and that calculate from the control people and we use the change of this correlation to measure the rewiring. Okay. Um, so this is we look at three different uh, uh, thresholds, right? So we look at the network rewiring and uh, Look at rewiring that we can we can rank all these pairs okay by the, the, the change of correlations right we we can define we can define cutoff saying if the, the change is above certain threshold we keep the edge otherwise we throw out the edge and uh, we can we can try different uh, the density in terms is the sense that now this one probably involves more edges than this one so this says you look at like uh, ten genes in total there are maybe forty five pairs right and so this density say we keep four point five edges. And this one we only say keep five or 4.5. Uh, no, this is 0.45 edges, right? So this density refers uh, the, the, the total number of edges you keep versus the total possible edges. And uh, as you can see, um, when, you, um, when we look at uh, the, this in terms of, we, we look at the edges, right? And then we can also look at the, the, um, the genes in, in those edges and to see whether they are enriched um, in the co-expression network or this, uh, the, the rewiring network, we always see some better enrichment uh, in the sort of the, the rewiring network. Uh, also you can see as we keep fewer and fewer edges, there's a better, better enrichment. And, uh, and also um, we look at this one on uh, compared, look at the edges. So in general, we do see this evidence saying that for the rewiring network, uh, we, there's really evidence uh, suggesting that uh, the, 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 uh, the edges connecting these two nodes, when there's an edge connecting, connecting the two nodes, the two nodes are more likely to have the same the disease association status. It's the same thing as the pathway I uh, described earlier, but it's a different way uh, to get to the topology where we can uh, start to define uh, the, 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 the pathway information there. And uh, it's really the same setup. And, uh, and this is more the, the empirical data to demonstrate that uh, actually there's some merit 
uh, to, uh, uh, for this rewiring or this uh, guilt by rewiring approach. So if you look at the x axis here, it's saying we start with the NIDTK data set. Um, we rank all the older genes, right? Either um, based on just the, the sort of the baseline information there, or uh, no, this is based on the not prioritized list and the prioritized list where we try to incorporate network information here. Um, we look at the replication rate in the WTCCC cohort. As in general, you see uh, this the uh, kind of a strange uh, the, the the bump here. But in general, you do see that uh, if you incorporate the rewiring information, you do get actually higher replication rate in the replication cohort. And uh, also, we did some uh, sort of negative controls as requested by the reviewers. And every single time uh, we rule out uh, this may now the possibility maybe due to an artifact. Another thing we look at the Parkinson disease. Uh, this is another disease we have. A, uh, I didn't include a slide for the. the there's a two data sets. There's a two uh, different. Uh, there's discovery cohort, and also there's a replication cohort. Also there's a microarray data sets uh, from these brains, these Parkinson disease patients. Uh, in general, also you'll see this prioritized uh, the uh, the list tends to have a better replication rate. But also there's a curious dip here. I don't know why, but. And the permutation doesn't show uh, the same pad level enrichment. So um, and another thing is, we have these ranked genes, right? Based on uh, the the prioritized, we can prioritize genes. We can look at say top 100, top 50, to see if there's any evidence these genes are enriched of in certain, uh, like um, look at the gene ontology, they are uh, enriched or they they tend to tend to have some similar biological functions. For Crohn's disease, the top genes they are sort of enriched in the insulin receptor on the signal transduction. It's a very, very generic uh, general terms, but does suggest a kind of immune-related response. Whereas for Parkinson's disease, the prioritized genes actually uh, are enriched in neurological system process. So there seems to be some merit, uh, both in terms of the replication rates uh, in the replication cohort, uh, as well as some kind of a, the more bioinformatics-based uh, annotations of the, the, these prioritized genes. Okay. But this is also is pretty. I mean, the, these two approaches, they, the the, word, the the same framework, the same topology, but we derive the topology from different ways. One is based on known pathways, the other way is based on the actually the the, the change of co-expression networks. I think the last part I'm going to talk about. Um, this also has been applied to study gene expression patterns in human brains. Uh, this is out of our collaboration uh, with uh, um, Nanette uh, Sesten, and so he, he got about like 10 or 20 million dollars a few years ago to do this uh, in uh, a bunch of uh, uh, different things. Um, this one thing is like there are 57 developing and adult um, post-mortem brains. So he had access uh, to this brain bank uh, where uh, they gather samples that they section into different regions of the brain. And there was a Nature paper uh, published, and there's uh, more papers coming up. Um, so these uh, 57 brains cover 15 different time periods of uh, brain development uh, from like fetus to like um, young adult and to adult. And uh, there's a say prenatal, postnatal, and uh, uh, prenatal, postnatal and adulthood. So there's a 15 regions, uh, there's 15 time periods covered. It's 57, so it's a small sample size, relatively speaking. But it does, uh, it do cover a pretty wide uh, uh, range of developmental stages. And for um, most brains, or some brains, um, in, in combination, they look at 16 different brain regions. Okay, there's 11 areas, the neocortex, also has five other areas. Okay. So you can think of, um, it's, it's a pretty interesting data set. You have like the spatial patterns, right? You have different brain regions. Also, you have temporal patterns. But they are coming from, they come from different, uh, different, different individuals. But in their initial analysis, uh, they look at, say, one region or one time point, one, uh, it's a, it's one time. So even though there's a, about in total 200 something like micro data sets, but coming to each particular time point or particular region, the number may be only somewhere between two and five. So if analyzed data just look at one time point, one region, the information is pretty limited, right? But that's how, how they did the initial analysis. They feel like there must be uh, some way of borrowing information across time points, 
also across different brain regions. Okay. So this is a basic uh, motivation for our approach. Um, there, there are two biological questions um, they set out to us in their initial paper. Right? The first one is um, simpler. So identify for a given gene of interest whether a gene is expressed or not in a given region or in a, at a particular stage. We look at gene A, whether it's expressed or not. And the secondary question, or second question, the follow-up question is um, whether a gene is differentially expressed between two developmental stages. Right? Compare condition one or time point one, component two, whether there's a differential expression. Right? So there's two different questions uh, that people ask. So the, the challenges are, as I mentioned, that it's a very low sample size. If you just analyze one region and one time point for our analysis, um, we need to borrow information across brain regions, and also we need to borrow information across time points. Okay. And as you can imagine, it's, we also, again, try to uh, capitalize or utilize this, uh, um, hidden, uh, this Markham random field model uh, to um, just to, uh, just to take advantage uh, of this sort of um, people. The data also suggest that way. We did some a lot of pretty pre work to really see that really the patterns. The regions, um, like the cortex regions, are more like each other than other regions. And also, if you look at two nearby time points, they are more like each other than time points further away. So your, your intuition, but we, we spent some time, actually quite some time, looking into data, and that, that's really the case. So um, again, we uh, utilize this Markov random field model to um, borrow information across regions and time points. Uh, essentially, if you just look at um, what the, the, the bottom equation is where, um, <laughs> uh, for the question one, in terms of whether a gene is expressed or not. And so we slightly changed the, the, the notation here because uh, the, the student, uh, Leon, he preferred different like, uh, notation, not minus one, one, but rather like zero, one, but maybe a little bit awkward, but so anyway, so this is really the, there's a two terms, right? So for each gene, this is a really the, um, the latent state, zero or one, right? This say, if a zero is not expressed, if one is expressed, right? And if it's not expressed um, due to sort of measurement error, the microarray noise is still the, the average intensity may not be zero. It says that's a mean, but lower mean than when the genes are expressed. So this is more of the, if you look at uh, the older genes on a particular time point, you can think about a, a simple mixture of two normal distributions, right? Genes expressed and genes not expressed. Uh, so there is how to try to correlate whether a gene expressed or not expressed to its neighbors. So this particular given region, um, but all the other regions in the brain, right? So we assume if a gene if a gene is expressed in one region, they also probably tend to express in other regions. And this beta one quantifies uh, how 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 much the, the likelihood, how much really increase uh, the, the 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 evidence or the, the potential for a gene to be expressed uh, in in this region, given the other regions are, are actually expressed. So this really captures the spatial dependence, okay, across different regions. Uh, this one is a very simple, like a one. I mean, just think about the first order uh, the, um, Markov model to capture that. If a gene is expressed, the, whether genes is expressed at time point, time point t, it depends on whether genes is expressed at time t minus 1 and t plus 1, but nothing else. Right? So spatial-wise, t at time point t only the condition on t, t minus 1, t plus 1, everything else is irrelevant. Right? And uh, this is a very, very broad uh, the defin the dependence. We'll assume there's all different regions, they have sort of kind of a sim symmetry. And the second approach, we try to distinguish the cortex region from neocortex regions. But this always thing can be can be modified by this sort of approach that we um, we put in. And uh, so so this one turns out this um, is very very easy to set up. But but, but Leon spent more than a year just to work out the numericals and to make it work. And the standard iterative uh, the uh, approach didn't work. So here I tried to use a Markov chain based EM approach. Uh, so I skipped those slides. <laughs> this one year's work there. Um, so for real data analysis, and uh, so what uh, he did is try to split these different genes into 10 different groups and run this algorithm uh, to see there's a kind of evidence uh, suggesting the algorithm may actually may converge or some kind of similarity on these different genes. There are 10 different groups, uh, they pretty much converge to uh, similar values other than there's a, a few, a couple, couple of things. But in general, uh, they, they fall into pretty the same ballpark. 
And, uh, and also it's a result, uh, just to show you that um, in general, um, this is a, the, the number of genes that change the latent states from expressed to unexpressed, or vice versa. And you can time point three and four, there's very little changes, right? But uh, um, the most changes you see here is between time periods of six and seven, and that's very really consistent with um, uh, actually the uh, people believe that where the most changes happen in the brain development. And also uh, other things. But, but uh, uh, to really show um, this has some merit um, through some synthetic data set or simulation studies, uh, it should be simulate on 100 genes, uh, 13 time points, and 16 brain regions, and mimicking sort of the, the, the real data, but we reduce the number of genes because the computationally is uh, quite demanding. So we look at 100 genes. And uh, this sort of setup to defining the, uh, the, the, uh, sort of the, the spatial dependence, also the, uh, the temporal dependence. Uh, this, the, uh, the relevant slides really show the, the improvement compared to the approach where you just analyze one region at a time, one time point at a time. So this is my misclassification rate in terms of classifying whether a gene is suppressed or not in a given region, a given time point. And this is based on the Markov random field model. It's about 10%, 8%, uh, depending on the separation between um, the expressed genes and non-expressed genes. The non-expressed uh, around zero here. Uh, it's about like if you have large separation, you do a better job on um, 2%. This is based on just analyzing um, one region and one time point. And you see there's actually, um, this is more, more, this is more in line with the real data estimate. And uh, there's a big difference uh, between whether you borrow information across regions, across time points, versus just analyzing one time point and one region at a time. And uh, for the second question, uh, to compare uh, whether uh, there's a gene uh, change expression level uh, between time point one and time point two, uh, it's a similar setup. Uh, it's not going to, uh, but the only difference here, we try to distinguish the cortex region from non-cortex regions here. Uh, because when we analyze real data, uh, for the previous one, we didn't see much difference in terms of similarity, in terms of expression. But in terms of differential expression, it does seem to be some difference between the cortex region and neocortex region. So we separate them into two re different regions. And uh, this is the details. Again, just skip those. Um, um, you can, you can, you can uh, send you the paper if you're interested in, in you know, this is more the, the technical details. But in general, uh, for real data analysis, um, and uh, we, we do see on the some, by, uh, by imposing the kind of spatial uh, dependence and temporal dependence, you are sort of imposing kind of, um, there are some similarities. It's no surprise when you look at across, uh, compared to like analysis based on single time point, single region, you do see more similarities. So there's no surprise. Um, but then we say um, whether that has anything to do uh, uh, with reality, uh, because for those things, the only data we have is the, 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 the data that uh, the from Yale, nothing else. So again, we took on more about informatics approach uh, to see there's any evidence that the genes we pull out, they are probably more interesting. Uh, also, uh, Leon uh, is a student uh, co-supervised co by uh, myself and also uh, a psychiatrist, Matthew State, uh, who was at Yale, but uh, who just started uh, his chairman position at UCSF. So my collaborators are just leaving Yale, like, yeah. Uh, but anyway, actually they identified a number of genes that have been uh, found associated with the autism. So that's really his dissertation, really interested in autism, uh, to identify genes for autism. So this is more his uh, side project, which turned into really a big challenge in one year, more than a year long um, project for him. Uh, so we are interested in, um, if we look at uh, all those, um, so this is more the background uh, for autism, as you know, like also it's pretty common here, um, pretty common in the States. Also, I think it's pretty, uh, it's um, maybe um, getting more uh, common here as well. And uh, so in total, there's not too many, like 11 um, genes, there's a pretty good consensus that they are associated with autism, right? So the, we then we look at um, the following questions, right? So, so for those genes, that show differential expression patterns between time points three and four, four and five, five and six. We want to see whether there's any evidence those genes are enriched or there's a kind of enrichment for uh, those genes, the 11 genes associated with autism. And uh, it turns out at time points, it's period of six to seven, the number of differential expression genes is 5.3. 
if it look at these 11, um, like 11 autism genes here. And uh, for the, this one, actually, there's a eight observed to be differentially expressed. So there's a full change of 1.5, 1.9. So in general, you do see that uh, these autism-related genes, they, they tend to actually show differential expression. They tend to be show you have differential patterns. There are some kind of changes during the developmental uh, stages. And, uh, and also, let me see the, this real data here, um, and also you see in terms of the brain development, there's a major uh, changes between time points six and time period seven here, right? And that, that says maybe um, this does give you some, some evidence that this, this particular approach maybe can um, pick up more relevant. If you do the, the traditional approach, it's not as, um, uh, as strong. Uh, again, the simulation suggests it does, uh, does do a better job. Okay, so these are the three stories I'm going, uh, I, I wanted to, to share with you in terms of, I think, the, how to apply this very simple uh, idea of micro random field model uh, to analyze genomics data, uh, both in terms of identifying genes associated uh, with disease as well to identify genes or uh, showing uh, the uh, differential expression patterns or just whether genes express or not uh, during the developmental stages. And it does give you very, very, uh, I think to me, a very flexible uh, uh, and powerful framework uh, to incorporate network information. But the, the key here, you actually to define the topology, the network, uh, that, that's the key. If you start with an arbitrary network, that's not going to help you anyway. Um, you have to really do a lot of uh, the investigative work that to, to make sure that the things you incorporate does carry information. And, uh, and also, I think these general these models can be applied to other uh, other areas. Uh, say, I think about social network and other things where you have probably much better defined connections right, uh, than what people uh, have been able to get from biology. And this is sort of like very very uh, tentative uh, social network stuff like Facebook and uh, all these social networks. The links are probably more real uh, than you try to infer from this data. And for um, things here, you want to say um, make inference about. Um, Someone's so, so the, the status you can think of uh, whether someone is rich or not, high uh, education level, or any other things that label someone. Uh, this can also can be uh, helpful, right? To, to help you to make underlying inference if you know all the neighbors, all the connections here. And uh, um, I skip many many slides as you see, and the child the, the commutation actually uh, is non-trivial. Um, it needs a lot of work, uh, but once it works, and it seems to actually work out the way that we want to. Uh, so it seems to uh, uh, really benefit us. And the uh, acknowledgement, and the first part um, was work done by Min Chen, who just moved uh, from uh, Southwest uh, Medical Center to UT Dallas um, in the math department. I think he sort of got tired of medical research, wanted to do some pure math kind of thing. But, uh, so, but it's done by, by him when he was a postdoc in the group. And the second part, the rewiring stuff, uh, was uh, done by scientists in our group, uh, Lin Ho. And it's based on, uh, this, uh, I think, very, very uh, competent uh, uh, graduate student uh, in, in, in the lab. Uh, so his undergrad major was biology in Tsinghua, knowing m not much about STAT. Now he probably knows more than anything else about this, the, 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 the Monte Carlo EM for Mark and Random Field. Um, also data are motivated by from collaborators Judy and Cho. I said, um, so she's moving to Mount Sinai, New York. He's at UCSF. He's still around. Hope he can stay. OK. <laughs> All right, thank you. Yeah. Uh, first yeah. question. Uh, when you use this uh, co-expression network, right? You, right. You, you assign all these scores to the age. Yeah. And I'm curious, did you consider cure the disease? Apply your your methods, and then uh, take the uh, data from expression data, transcript to transcript only data from drug treating patients to see whether your tested you know, actually the two, two conditions, cases and control, and drug cure disease, right? Right. As, the, as a test. Did, 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 did you consider to that? No, not really. Did you, uh, I think if you, yeah, choose that kind of data, if those uh, scores networks right. and come back to normal, mm -hmm. I think that would be really convincing. Okay, that's the first problem. Okay, Second sure one, normal, but yeah. But I think we uh, there are certain data we are we are following up um, patients. Uh, so we, we have some ongoing trial. Uh, we take multiple measures, the transcriptome as well as sort of the, 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 the 
the, um, the all different the, the kinase, all these different the preomics markers over time. But it's a very small sample size. But to get this network inference, you need decent sample size. I mean, but I think the in principle that can be done, but but we have a basic grade point. We can probably explore that. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Second yeah. point. Yeah. Second one is uh, you have those transcript data, and when you think about SNPs, right, is uh, use topology data to enhance the prediction right. association markers. Right. Did you consider incorporate the expression data that uh, make uh, the topology data? Because when they construct normally it's done in vitro, in right. heterologous system, and that doesn't mean anything in terms of tissue and temporary the spatial right. regulation or cell types. And then if you can use this one integrate together, do you, do you find the changes in association sounds markers? Good, yeah. Sounds we need to have a joint student, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I will ask one question. Uh, in your framework, uh, does, uh, do you mean that we need to use uh, one MRF for different networks? I mean that you cannot combine the expansion number of the past way network together to draw, uh, to draw the, uh, the association inference simultaneously? So, so right now there's only one. Um, on, so for each data type, we can use one marker random field, but in you may, that's a good question, you may combine different network information and give it different weights. I don't know, that's a good question, I don't know, yeah. But it's easier just to look at one network time, but there may be multiple, multiple ones, yeah. Yeah. The other suggestion or question that I'd like to throw in is applying the very powerful methods that you have used with human to a model organism that's simple enough that a lot is known about it, like right. the elegans, for example. Okay. So, lots known about the metabolic pathways, lots known about development, lots known about the the neurological wiring. Right. I'd like to see. I like the worms. I'd right. like to see these. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'd like to see. These I like these better. Yeah. Put together with a simple model organism to prove it all works and right. to investigate it and then apply it back to the higher system again. Yeah, I think a good thing about humans uh, in this particular uh, setup is that uh, we are so different, right? So uh, in order really to get these edges, uh, you need a lot of variations there, right? Yeah. Uh, so we just have, say, the, like, say for example, two, two inbred lines of mice for just knockout versus normal. It's, it's pretty hard to really get the edges. I mean, you say these genes upregulated or downregulated compared the mutants to the, to the, to the controls. Um, but if you have a lot of different perturbations, then you can start to build kind of co-expression network. If you just have two conditions, it's pretty hard, right? Sure. So that, that's, you, there's some kind of simplicity, also some challenge if to want to apply this. But if you have a lot of the C elegance data, I know there's a different, uh, different stages, a different, if you pull this C elegance, a tons of those, yeah, put them together, there may be a way to do it, yeah. But, yeah. On the known networks, you mentioned that actually the known networks are directed, right? But then you model it. No, I just remove the edges. Yeah. You just remove it. And so why, uh, do you think it makes a big difference, uh, you know, uh, ignoring that direction? I mean, that, that's... That we need, probably need to move away from this sort of a classical definition of marker run. Right, right, right. right. You yeah. have to use some kind of directed like graphical models. Or, yeah, you can say the Bayesian network kind of yeah. stuff. Yeah, Bayesian network. That, that so maybe. Do you think that, do you think you'd see a difference or? Uh, but in, in terms of, yeah, um, I think the first we need to explore whether like the directionality gives you actual information compared to undirected network, right? So if there's a plus one upstream, then probably more likely or likely to be plus one downstream or upstream, you may change a little bit of that. And uh, I think that that may be worth looking into, um, but I'm not sure how without, without looking at data, but it's really, would be, for co-expression, there's no edges. I think only for like the signal network, uh, there, there may be, we probably haven't, we haven't looked into that. That's, that's, that's a great question, but there may be some benefit or some actual information you can extract at the statistical level. Um, you say there's some, maybe some benefit doing that. But the, the, the framework we have now doesn't apply. Uh, you have to have different kind of different rationality built into it. Okay, thank you. Yeah.